420. By 425, if any Jack is still in the sack, he's en retard, late. So you, son, are the fourth bell. Starting tomorrow, you go into the bunkhouse and wake les en retard. How? You tap them on the shoulder, give them a shake, scream in their ear if you have to. Then Mr. Murray said good night, and Marvin was alone again. It seemed to Marvin he had just crawled under the bearskin when he heard the first bell. The fire was out and the room was cold and dark. He lit the kerosene lamp and pulled on his double thick long underwear, two pairs of socks, two pairs of knickers, and two sweaters. Then he put on his cut down overcoat. After the second bell, Marvin heard the jacks heading toward the eating hall. It was nearly time for his first job. He ran through the cold morning darkness to the bunkhouse, peeked in, and counted five huge lumps in the shadows. Five jacks in the sacks. Marvin waited just inside the door. At the third bell, Marvin was relieved to see two jacks climb out of bed. He thought there must be a brucha, a Hebrew blessing for something like this. His father knew all sorts of baruchas. Blessings for seeing the sunrise, blessings for the first blossom of spring. Was there a barucha for a rising lumberjack? If he said a barucha, maybe the other three would get up on their own. One lump stirred, then another. They grunted, rolled, and climbed out from under the covers. Their huge shadows slid across the ceiling. One jack was still in the sack. Marvin took a deep breath, walked bravely over to the bed, reached out, and tapped the jack's shoulder. It was like poking a granite boulder. The jack's beard ran right into his long, shaggy hair. Marvin couldn't even find an ear to shout into. He cupped his hands around his mouth and leaned forward. Up. The jack grunted and muttered something in French. Get up, Marvin pleaded. Another jack pulled on his boots, boomed, Lève-toi, Jean-Louis, lève-toi, and shuffled out the door. Lève-toi, Jean-Louis, lève-toi, Marvin repeated. Jean-Louis opened one eye. It glittered like a blue star beneath his thick black eyebrow. He squinted, as if trying to make out the shape in front of him then blinked and sat up. Bonjour, Marvin whispered. Qui es-tu? Quel est ton nom? I don't speak French, just bonjour, derriere, and left toi. That's all? No more? The man opened his eyes wide now. So what is your name? Marvin. Ah, Marvin. Jean-Louis repeated, as if tasting the sound of his name. Will you get up? Marvin asked anxiously. Jean-Louis growled and fixed him in the hard blue squint of one eye. Please. Marvin stood straight and tried not to tremble. Jean-Louis grunted and swung his feet from beneath the covers. They were as big as skillets, and one of his huge toenails was bruised black and blue. Marvin tried not to stare. Marvin and Jean-Louis were the last to arrive at the breakfast table. The only sounds were those of chewing and the clink of forks and knives against the plates. At each place were three stacks of flapjacks, one big steak, eight strips of bacon, and a bowl of oatmeal. In the middle of the table were bowls of potatoes and beans with molasses, platters with pies and cakes, and blue jugs filled with tea coffee, and milk. Marvin stared at the food in dismay. It's not kosher, he thought. In Marvin's house, it was against ancient Jewish law to eat dairy products and meat together. And never, ever did a Jew eat bacon. Marvin came to a quick decision. One day he would eat the flapjacks and oatmeal with milk. The next day he would eat the steak and the oatmeal without milk. And never the bacon. After breakfast, as they did every morning, the jacks went to the tool house to get their saws and axes. Then, 
Wearing snowshoes and pulling huge sleds piled with equipment, they made their way into the Great Woods, where they would work all day. Marvin went directly to his office after breakfast. Mr. Murray was already there, setting out Marvin's work. A fresh pot of ink was thawing in a bowl of hot water on the wood stove. There were two boxes on the desk filled with scraps of paper. Cord chits, Mr. Murray said. The jacks are paid according to the number of cords they cut in a pay period, two weeks. You figure it out. I'm no good as a bookkeeper and have enough other things to do around here. Each chit should have the jack's name, or, if he can't write, his symbol. His symbol? Marvin asked weakly. Yes. Jean-Louis's is a thumbprint. Here's one. He held up a small piece of paper with a thumbprint on it the size of a baby's fist. Marvin blinked. It was all very confusing. Sometimes two names were on one chit. These were called doublies. There were even some triplies. This meant more calculations. And sometimes chits were in the wrong pay period box. Marvin sat staring at the scraps. There is no system, he muttered. Where to begin? His mother always made a list when she had many things to do. So first, Marvin listed the Jack's names alphabetically and noted the proper symbol for those who could not write. Then he listed the dates of a single pay period, coded each chit with the dates, and, with a ruler, made a chart. By the end of the morning, Marvin had a system and knew the name or symbol for each man. There were many chits with the huge thumbprint of Jean-Louis. Every day, Marvin worked until midday, when he went into the cookhouse and ate baked beans and two kinds of pie with Mr. Murray and the cook. After lunch, he returned to his office and worked until the Jacks returned from the forest for supper. By Friday of the second week, Marvin had learned his job so well that he finished early. He had not been on his skis since he had arrived at camp. Every day, the routine was simply meals and work, and Marvin kept to his office and away from the lumberjacks as much as he could. But today he wanted to explore, so he put on his skis and followed the sled paths into the woods. He glided forward, his skis making soft whisking sounds in the snow. This certainly was different from city skiing in Duluth, where he would dodge the ragman's cart or the milkman's wagon, where the sky was notched with chimney pots belching smoke where the snow turned sooty as soon as it fell. Here in the great north woods, all was still and white. Beads of ice glistened on bare branches like jewels. The frosted needles of pine and spruce pricked the eggshell sky, and a ghostly moon began to climb over the treetops. Marvin came upon a frozen lake covered with snow, which lay in a circle of tall trees like a bowl of sugar. He skimmed out across it on his skis, his cheeks stinging in the cold air, and stopped in the middle to listen to the quietness. And then Marvin heard a deep, low growl. At the edge of the lake, a shower of snow fell from a pine. A grizzly bear? Marvin gripped his ski poles. A grizzly awake in the winter. What would he do if a bear came after him? Where could he hide? Could he outski a grizzly? Marvin began to tremble, but he knew that he must remain still, very still. Maybe, Marvin thought desperately, the grizzly would think he was a small tree growing in the middle of the lake. He tried very hard to look like a tree but concentrating on being a tree was difficult because Marvin kept thinking of the bundle on the train platform. 